Hi, folks. Welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio. Thanks to all of you who have joined me here on my channel. And as you know, I interview people in the Beatle world, musicians, podcasters, authors, you name it. And I am uh, really thrilled to introduce my guest this time. For nearly half a century, he has been part of one of the greatest bands in rock history, being the drummer for Yes!, and here uh, we're going to be talking about his involvement in the early part of his career before, yes, when he played on George Harrison's All Things Must Pass album. And also prior to that, he worked with John. Um, he was on the Instant Karma Signal and also was part of the Lyceum Ballroom concert that took place the end of 1969 for Christmas. And then later, after All Things Must Pass, he played on the Imagine album. We welcome, very proudly here, to this channel, Alan White. Hi, Alan. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm so grateful that uh, you're here uh, giving us this interview for my channel. I want to talk, first of all, about um, your involvement with All Things Must Pass. My guess is because of your work with John and George being with you, for those events that I just mentioned, Instant Karma yeah. and the Lyceum well, Ballroom, that's what led to it all? You're being on the album? Uh, yeah, well, let me just correct it a little bit. The Imagine album was before All Things Must Pass. No, I know. I said that. So, yeah. It's, I'll it's you recorded. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, but the reason for me during All Things Must Pass is because George came to quite a few of the sessions um of imagine and we ate dinner together in the evening and with the whole band and everybody around a big wooden table and i got to know him and and when it came to do and all things must pass he had me join him in the studio which was very nice of him and uh, i must have say what a really great person he was uh, john and George were both incredibly forthcoming and just like took me under their wing, basically. Mm. <clears throat> for, for I was the young. I was kind of like the young drummer in the uh, that uh, just turned up there, and they had me playing a lot of things. Sure. When you when you started recording with George for All Things Must Pass, from what you observed, was he at all hesitant or nervous? I mean, this was his first real pop rock album, or did he have confidence? Uh, did he display I that? I didn't sense any nervousness. Um, I think everybody involved was just another thing that they were getting on with in their lives. Um, you know, I, my drums were set up the whole time we were in the EMI studios and we were in there for about three weeks. Um, mm. Everybody had turned up in the uh, you know, late morning and then we gradually get into listening to the song of the day and uh, get into recording. Um, I didn't sense any notices, maybe, Maybe George did because there was a lot of pressure on him because it was a, a solo album after the Beatles broke up, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was Phil Spector, of course, who was in the control room most of the time. I hardly ever saw him. Right. But George was seems to be conducting things out in the studio, making sure everybody played the right thing. And um, as a result, I think everyone made a great album. Um, but um, it was a, a very pleasurable experience and I really enjoyed every moment of it. Do you think that um... Well, did, did Phil Spector at all communicate with the musicians there, maybe over the intercom or anything, what he yeah, wanted from them? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> occasionally, but not much at all. He just let George get on with what he wanted to do. But he did 
have conferences with George and he'd let him know what was good and bad and whatever. And George, George would come out and then reconstruct things. But um, surprisingly enough, with so many players playing at once on the backing track, uh, a lot of things, you know, there wasn't a lot that went wrong. It was usually pretty close to in the first five takes of the song, we get it. Really? That's great. Um, th I wanted to ask you, because you had so yeah. many great musicians all there at the same time. Now, for drums, there was you, there was Jim Gordon, there was Ringo. From song to song, how do you decide when you've got three great drummers there, which one drums, which one plays percussion? Was that all worked out in George's head or was it very spontaneous? Well, when you go to the, um, the credits on the record, hmm. um, nobody really, I, I guess the people who did all of that stuff must be in George and stuff, but he couldn't remember who played him what. I know what I played on and um, I know what I did, didn't play on, but um, uh, I, I, it was very, very confusing on the album cover right. um, in the studio. I mean, I know I definitely played on My Sweet Lord and the title track, All Things Must Pass, um, Darkness. Um, I, I, you know, I, I just have a vivid memory of what songs I did do. Mm. Uh, isn't it a pity? Right. Uh, John Lennon, the, uh, the Bob Dylan song that he covered. If not for you. If not for you, yeah. Uh -huh. So you were on quite a bit of the album there. And, yeah, uh, I was on quite a bit of it. I'd, I'd roughly say, I mean, off the top of my head, two thirds of it. Hmm. So uh, there's a lot of stuff on there. <laughs> right. I was going to yeah, say was... almost the same thing for, say, the keyboard players. And you had Billy Preston there. You had Gary Wright there. You had Gary Brooker. I mean, it's it's another thing. How do you decide who plays on each song? And Bobby Whitlock. And doubt and yeah, sure. I shouldn't forget yeah, him. He, he was on quite a lot of it. Yeah. Um, and he played Hammond organ most of the time because he was part of the Delaney and Bonnie band. Sure. Who was a fixture that came in every day. Um, and but Jim Gordon didn't come with him every day. He sometimes come in a bit later, and, and then you know. So I, I don't think Jim Gordon played on many tracks at all. And uh, I remember doing uh, My Sweet Lord, and I know I said to George, I said. Um, I said, well, uh, he said, I want you to play um, drums and Ringo can play tambourine. I said, I don't feel comfortable doing that. Mm. You know, it's Ringo and he's part of the Beatles. And, I, and it wasn't a, it wasn't in a difficult part. But and he said, no, I want you to play the drums. And so I spent the whole uh, all of the takes with Ringo on the other side of the um, uh, glass booth, you know. Mm -hmm. and he was playing tambourine and I played drums. So, um, it was, overall, it was a great experience, you know. You know, for so many years, I've read that it was Ringo that was the drummer on My Sweet Lord. So, this is a surprise to me. I know you also told Shelly Germo in an interview about, about this. Thank you, Shelly, by the way, who helped to arrange this interview. But um, yeah. there, there was no notes or documentation at all during these sessions of who no. played on what? None at all. It was just being all done from memory, which, um, you know, 
obviously they couldn't remember everything when it came to do doing new credits, but um, I just have a vivid recoll recollection of uh, what I did, <laughs> mm. and um, and uh, but it was a great meeting, you know, like Eric Clapton, and he was there every day, and um, it was like a like a regular band that turn up and just record everything. Right. So uh, most of the most of those songs on All Thinking for the Past was a, a, a group of musicians that played together on a daily basis. Hmm. Did George give you any direction for what he wanted from your, your drum part? Or did he just let you play whatever you wanted? Pretty much. I mean, he was... Yeah, he did. He, you know, um, he was like John with me. He said it was kind of like John always used to say to me, Alan, I don't know what you're doing, but what you're doing is great. Keep on doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, there was never much question about my role, uh, what I was doing for each song. So, um, no, not, not that much direction at all. He was just happy with mo most things that were going down, yes. Hmm. Since you mentioned John, he was there at the sessions? John Lennon? Not at George's sessions. Okay, I thought that I had heard also that, because there no. have been rumors that he no. was there during all well, things was passed. At, at the sessions for Imagine. Oh, sure. Obviously, yeah, the other way around. <laughs> now, um, Bobby Whitlock has his own YouTube channel, and um, I, I seen just a few of his videos. But he has talked a bit about all things must pass, and that he helped out with a lot of the arrangements of the songs. Did you witness that? That he had a lot yeah, to do with the arrangements. He was well involved. Yes. Um, to what degree, I don't know, but. I know he was um, consulted about things. Yeah, and it was like a it was like a regular band that turned right. up all of the time, and everybody chip in with ideas and what have you, um, of which he was part of. Hmm. When you started with each song, uh, I thought I had read that um, you had heard demos the demos for the songs. Yeah, right? we saw them with demos and a couple of them, George actually played them yeah, on guitar. So once it started with the full band arrangement, I'm sure that George knew what he wanted, right? And he just yeah, told the they music. Were, they were almost in a, I wouldn't say finished form, but uh, there was a lot of similar uh, similarity between the demo and and what we ended up with just with you know obviously was it done more professional mm. because you know for many years uh there's been a bootleg out called beware of apco of george's demos and as uh, it turns yeah. out it's only really half of them because yeah. this new box set that's coming out has two discs of that from yeah. each one from a separate day, two days in a row. So yeah. I'm figuring that you heard those acoustic demos. That's what George played for you first? Um, yeah, I mean, we just, he put them on the controller and play them out in the studio. And we had no idea of what we were dealing with. And then try parts out and then come up with uh, an arrangement. Hmm. So, so much great music on, on all the, the two albums there. Were there any songs that you would say were the most challenging or the most difficult to play or took longer than others? Yeah, My Sweet Lord was pretty easy to play. The only thing that was difficult about that was um, we did a live, when it was recording, we did a live fade in. So I had to start really quiet and then build up. And um, that was the most difficult part about My Sweet Lord. Um, 
I'm trying to think of what, if not the, if not for you, it's pretty simple to play. Hmm. If it was just brushes and, um, uh, I think most of the songs were relative, from a drum point of view, relatively easy to get a grip on. And, hmm. um, and uh, nothing complex. Of course, I'm speaking like that because I play in Yes, where everything's complex. Sure. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and the people call me up all the time, said, how do you count this? And I said, I don't count it. I wrote it, and it's in my head. So, uh -huh. Yeah, so. Now, Phil uh, Spector. To answer, you, to answer your question, none of them were a big task to play. And uh, it was just a general good feeling in the room of a group all playing together. Hmm. Were there certain were there songs where you were debating whether or not to to actually rehearse them because there's so many other songs that George wrote around that time. And mm -hmm. was it all decided exactly what songs would be played? Because, um, you know, one of my favorite songs that has surfaced over the years, well, actually, when the All Things Must Pass, um, the version that came out in 2001 came out, there was a bonus track, I Live, uh, I Live For You, which I thought was an amazing song that didn't make the original album. Yeah, was there any discussion good. about other songs that, that no. George was considering? George knew pretty much what he wanted on the album. Yeah. I don't think there was much deviating from that. He had a good idea of what... George was very, you know, convinced in what he wanted to do, let's put that. Uh, he, um, but he was never authority you know you would just let things go on and but obviously pick up on things that didn't work properly mm. but um he was like john he, he knew exactly what he wanted to say and do and um i only remember a couple of times going into the control room after recording something um, with everybody, basically, we all sat around and went, oh, that's pretty good. And that's the tape we should keep it. Um, but only on a few songs. The rest of them, it was kind of, oh, well, we were convinced that that was the one anyway, without a listen back. You yeah. know, it's kind of interesting. There's, um, there's an interview that I read recently that Anthony DeCurtis put up on Facebook that he did an interview, it was around the year of 2000 with Phil Spector. And Phil was talking about the differences between producing John and producing George. And what Phil had said at that time was that John kind of knew what he wanted and he went for the feel, he went for the vibe and usually everything was done very quickly. But George on the other hand was more insecure. He wanted to do take after take after take of certain songs. And, um, you know, he, he also said words to the effect that the reason why he had so many musicians on his album was because of his insecurity, you know, to be surrounded by a, as much talent. This is what he's saying. I'm not saying I agree with it. <laughs> I'm just saying what, what was in, in this interview. Yeah, I couldn't write into that. And, uh, you know, um, I never got a sense of insecurity from George. But he was, you know, you could tell he was pondering on certain things over and over. And uh, uh, so I guess, I guess you can look at it that way. Hmm. Um, just being a little bit nervous and making sure he got everything right. But I think he achieved a, a great album in the end and uh, wow. was proud to be called of it. Hey, All Things Must Pass is a masterpiece, and I don't think anybody would debate that. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of surveys, there are so many fans that rate it as the best of all the solo Beatle albums. And we all really? have our favorites, but I will never, ever, you know, anyone that says that, I'm not going to argue. It's such an incredible album, and you've got two albums worth of tremendous material there. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with them, but you know, it's very hard for me to say that after playing on the Imagine, because I played on uh, every song on Imagine, and I would accept Jealous Sky, Jim Keltner played on that, and I played vibraphone on that song in the bathroom. <laughs> that must be an experience. Yeah, um, which was only about six by six, and I had a vibraphone. And I kept the door open six inches, and that's how I could see John at the piano, and I could see everybody in the room through this six-inch gap. Right. And, uh, that they did that for the reverb in the bathroom. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, when um when Phil Spector left the sessions because he worked like midway, he quit working on the album. Was there a different vibe? in the studio then, or was anything different oh, about yeah. the sessions? Well, the film was very quiet. He, he, he was almost not there. He just sit, sit back in his chair and observe what was going on and listen to what was going on. And then they'd have a conference with uh, George and himself and we'd fix whatever was wrong when George came in the studio and then uh, <laughs> he didn't really miss him because we never really saw him in the studio that much. Hmm. He was in the control room most of the time. Right. Yeah. Did you, because um, over the years we've heard that um, Peter Frampton showed up during the sessions yeah, yeah. and uh, Phil Collins and what, what they say about Phil is that he played congas on The Art of Dying, but it wasn't used in the final mix. Um, Peter Frampton. Yeah. Um, I never actually saw Phil no? in the studio. And I, ne I never saw Peter. <laughs> hmm. um, I think most of the stuff that they did was overdubbed uh, because there was a group that turned up every day they did most of the backing tracks. And then um, we'd go home and they'd do overdubs and stuff later, obviously. But uh, we'd all gone. But I left my drums in there for the whole three weeks. Right. So all the overdubbing that was done, especially I'm thinking more along the lines of the orchestration that was used for something like Isn't It a Pity? or brass, like, like for Isn't one? It a Pity? You know, there's orchestration that was done on a song like that, that John Barham did. And- uh, I, I didn't quite get the question, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying that all of the overdubbing that must have been done later, like there was orchestration used on certain songs on the album, um, and the brass on something like What Is Life. You never witnessed any of that. That was all done afterwards. Yeah, no, the uh, the brass played in the studio. Oh, really? Okay. Jim Price and Bobby Keys, and they were the amongst the band. The band all played together. Okay. Um, obviously, we were all in isolated booths and stuff like that, but um, but it was all come together and you could hear all of that coming down the earphones when you record it. The full big band, you know. Mm. Boy, I wish I could have been there for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh. it was, uh, I, I loved it. It was exciting to be there every day doing it. Mm. Do you have any idea why two versions was recorded of Isn't It a Pity? Two versions? two versions of the same song. Oh, there two were two versions. versions. <laughs> Not the album, two versions. That's an entirely I different know. story. Well, I was going to say, what's that got to do with it? Uh, um, no, I don't know. I really don't know why there was two versions. Um, one of the songs, I know. I remember. What was the name of that? Isn't it a pity? Isn't it? Yeah. There was a more stripped down version that was version two. Yes. Uh, I know 
I think I played brushes on one and I played with regular drumsticks on part of the other one. I, I, it's very hard to recall recall that situation though. Hmm. Now after after you recorded this album, did you stay in touch with George through the years? Yes. Um, George was a very underrated musician in the Beatles, I think. He had a lot of great chord progressions and he did some good soloing work and then, you know, obviously uh, with Eric there, he did quite a bit of the soloing. Um, I remember the song Wah Wah. Uh -huh. It sticks out to me. Because that was a very powerful driving song. And I remember when we did that. And, and George said, well, the song's going to be called Wah Wah. Oh, I thought to myself, oh, guess what the lead instrument's going to be. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it was just uh, of which Eric was a master of. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, from what you were saying before, for the main two albums, most of the drumming was done by you and Ringo, because you said you didn't see Jim Gordon that much. I think Jim played on a couple of things, and um, and. Um, I don't know how much Ringo actually played on the drums. Um, I just know what tracks I performed on. It's a, you mm -hmm. know, my sweet Lord, all things must pass. And um, I go through all the titles. I could pick them out of which ones I did. But I know generally it was about two thirds of the album. Oh. Okay. Were you ever consulted for anything for this new box set coming out? Were you interviewed? No. Did... Uh, uh, I didn't. I think Bobby Whitlock got upset because he, he didn't do any interviews or something, didn't he? Mm. I'm know. hearing that. You know, he did uh, a, a few a few videos on his channel, and then I heard that they were removed. From oh. his channel, and so there's a big controversy surrounding that, and yeah. um, so mean, I wasn't he, sure if anybody, any of the musicians that were involved that are still with us, have been approached with interviews at all, yeah. and um, you know it would be a shame if if they weren't. In addition well, to I, those I, that have I, passed I, away, there should be there should be some quotes from those I people know, well, too. I would hope. I never got approached for any interviews with a 50 year release, right? Mm -hmm. And um, no, but that didn't upset me. I mean, it's the way they, Apple does things and George's estate, I guess. But um, I wouldn't get upset at that because I just have great memories of the whole time I spent down doing that, so. Uh, mm. they, they can promote it any any way they want, you know. And uh, it's just, like I said, proud to be part of it. Right. Okay. Um, any memories you want to share about working with John? First of all, there's instant karma. Oh, did you? Well, did you? Um, by any chance, you have the the box set that came out recently of the yeah. Plastic on All Band? No, I've got it. Yeah. Yeah, so you've heard the evolution mixes of It's the Karma? It's beautifully done. It's oh, yeah. Really, it's really well done. And uh, I, I don't know what it retails for. Do you know what it retails for? Oh, gosh. I think I paid because I got the... It's like the... It was around $150. Yeah. I think it's five or six CDs and the Blu-ray disc. That's yeah. what I got. So I think yeah. it was it was reasonable as far as I'm concerned. Oh, actually, yeah. I think it was less than that, actually. For so. what it is, because it's so well done and made. Hmm. Um, pretty incredible. Um, but the, um, yeah, welcome with John in the studio. It was very much a similar feeling. They became 
more like a group of guys getting together every day. Mm -hmm. Turn up in the late morning, you know, have breakfast if you wanted it. And we work all day listening to music like we did with George. <clears throat> You'd listen to backing tracks, so John would play it. And then um, we get into recording it. And uh, <clears throat> once it was done, we'd listen back. And then everybody would have dinner all around a big wooden table together and talk about it. And, you know, and then those people who weren't needed just went home or, or you could hang around if you wanted to. It's a very loose atmosphere. Right. But in the case of Instant Karma, that was all done in one day. So that must have been an experience finishing the whole song up in one day like that. It felt, it felt like quicker than a day. Um, <laughs> I got a call in the morning from Mal Evans, mm. uh, who is, as you know, was the Beatles. Brody. And, and mm. uh, um, he said, Alan, are your drums in your car? And I said, yeah, and he said, jump in the car, bring your drums down. John wrote a song last night and he wants to record it this morning. And he wants to release it, release it on Monday. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of like instant sure. recording. <clears throat> so I do remember side things about it because uh, we got the back and track, and I think that particular is uh, the track where John turned me and said, "I don't, know. I don't know. I think he's talking about the drum break in there, and it's out of, it's, uh, it, it, it's not in the same momentum. It's a, it's a rock and roll drum break in amongst a shuffle, mm. uh, which is something I was working on at that time." Yeah. And he said, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. <laughs> and uh, so if you if you watch the video on from top of the props mm. that we did of that, when it comes to drum break, John looks over to me and just laughs, going, I still can't work it out. <laughs> so, uh, it's kind of funny in that way. Um but yeah, I do remember also that uh, it was getting to late afternoon and we had most of the back and track done. In fact, all of it. And um, John said, I remember playing piano on it with, with John and me at one piano and uh, Gary Wright and Klaus Fuhrman on the other one. We mm. just got Ding, 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 uh -huh. all the way through the song. Anyhow, uh, John said, we need more backing vocals on the choruses. Like, we all shine on. Right. So we were trying to do some overdubs and stuff to get it, but he said, there's not enough. So he sent Mal Evans down to one of these clubs in London, and um, he he invited the whole, all of the club back to the studio to sing We All Shine On. I thought, this, they're all drunk. And <laughs> I said, this is going to be a complete mess. And you know what? Surprised the hell out of me. They all sang in tune and in time. It was unbelievable. And there was me and John and... Um, Conducting them, and I'm going, I can't believe it sounds like it does. Uh -huh. They just did, I think, two or three takes, and, and they all went back home. <laughs> Something magical was in the air that day, I tell you. Okay. Do you have any memories of, of Phil Spector with that record? Not really. It's the uh, same again. Phil was in the control room most of the mm. time. And uh, 
never said much at all. Um, he did come over the, in the car a few times, but very little really. And then Joel, you know, John would go in and have a conference with him and then listen to what was going on and come out and say, all right, let's, let's do it again. It sounds great. But we, I don't think we did many takes at all. No. no. So. But I tell you, the one thing that I find fascinating about that evolutionary mix that's on the box set is that all these years we've been hearing George Harrison played on the song, but you didn't really hear a guitar part from him. And there's an actual yeah. like a uh, lead guitar part that he's playing, which didn't work out that well, but you could hear it in the very beginning. So you can yeah. tell that he was there. And he was like, yeah. there, there was some banter between George and the other musicians that you could hear just a little bit. So at least you get the feeling that, you know, in the atmosphere that George was part of that session, you know? Yeah, I believe he was there, but it was, that was, those sessions are very, very easy to remember. I mean, I remember certain things, but actually recording it was done so quickly, it kind of surprised me. Mm. And um, uh, now, to this day, whenever I play Instant Calm with anybody who wants to play it as a jam thing, um, uh, you know, I've done quite a few rock and roll fantasy camps, right. and uh, and uh, Hudson, one of the Hudson brothers, Mark Hudson, uh, Mark Mark Hudson, he, he said, "Alan, do that drum break," <laughs> and I'm going, <laughs> "What?" He said, "No, I want I want to start the song with a drum break, finish it with a drum break, and do it in the middle." And I said, Mark, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a very funny guy. I, I really like him a lot. Mm. A bit on the crazy side, but that's that's how we like him. <laughs> well, you know, he's a musician. What do you, what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know many that are not, you know. Just a few words, if you will, about Yoko with John um, in the... The recent documentary, Above Us Only Sky, there are moments there when you can see at Tittenhurst Park that Yoko is making some suggestions to some of the songs for the Imagine oh, album. Yeah. Was it very much a collaboration in your in your, yeah, in your Yoko, mind between the two of them? He, he consulted with Yoko pretty much all the way through the album. Hmm. And um, she was in his ear quite a lot telling him, I think it was mostly to do with the lyrics and how how we presented them, and, um, and then I, I guess he must have changed a few things that she she agreed with. But in general, I liked Yoko. She just never said a bad word to me. Nothing. She was just a really nice person. It was part of part of the group, really. Oh, absolutely. I always maintain she was the biggest influence on his life in so many ways that went beyond his, his music. So I think so. Yeah. She he used to consult her on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do remember I do remember one thing. It's a very outlandish thing. One day we were recording, I forget which track it was, but it got to about seven in the evening and we'd been playing the song and John said, okay, we got to stop. And I said, okay, we'll stop. And um, he said, he really wanted to watch this sitcom on TV. Uh -huh. and I said, I can't even remember what it was, but um, Eric Clapton was there. Klaus Woman, um, Yoko, and me, I believe. I believe that's all. Uh -huh. And we went up because the whole time we were making Imagine, John's house was being under construction. Right. There were yeah. there every day. 
So um, we went up this spiral staircase and there was one bedroom, nothing in it except a bed and a TV. Mm -hmm. And we all laid on the bed and John turned on the TV and we watched this sitcom. It was, I thought of myself, I'm lying in bed watching a sitcom with all these superstars around me. It was <laughs> quite mind blowing. Yeah, so, I mean, you got to remember, I was only 20 when I did that. Mm. It was like, you know, I, I kind of seemed to, as I thought, take it in my stride for a 20 year old, but only years later, like 10 years later, I went, did I really do all that stuff? Mm. It's pretty remarkable because John discovered you when you were playing in a bar, right? With a band yeah, called Griffin. I never actually saw him. People just told me that, that John was in there. And I used to know some of the people from Apple and I'd go in there occasionally into the headquarters. So they knew how to get hold of me. Hmm. And, and uh, yeah, that's when John called me and said, Seems like you'd be good to play on, on this, you know? <laughs> yeah. But like yeah. overnight, you were there for Live Peace in Toronto. Well, like I that. guess I have a lot of my life, I've taken a bull by the horns and just jumped in the deep end, as it were, and seemed to survive somehow. Hmm. And joining Yes was the same. Yeah. I three days to learn the repertoire, you know? And, and then they said, oh, by the way, we're doing a gig on Monday. And I went, what? <laughs> so, and I had to learn Close to the Edge and all of these pretty complex songs. Um, uh, first gig was nerve wracking as hell for me and the band. And then uh, we seemed to get through that without much trouble, but the third and fourth gig were a little shaky. Uh -huh. But I obviously got better after that. Here I am. And uh, next July, it'll be 50 years in the US. How do you explain how this band yeah. has, endured, has endured all this time? And what's kept it interesting for you? Uh, the music. I've always seen Dan and uh, playing really damn good music. I mean, the thing that keeps yes together over all these years is is very high standard of musicianship and hmm. and quality of music. And that appeals to me. I, I love the challenge. Right. Do you think by having a lot of lineup changes through the years, that's kept it interesting? Well, yeah, but, you know, I am actually, I think, the only... A uh, person who's been in the, the band the whole time. It would have been me and Christopher, but Christopher passed yeah. away. Hmm. Um, um, and I played with Chris, you know, pretty much on a daily basis for 43 years. So we, we knew each other's playing and a lot about each other. So. Uh, but Billy Sherwood, who plays now, he's a really good, Chris was his mentor, and uh, he plays very like Chris and uh, sings like him too. Mm. Well, you'd be proud of my family because I have a wife and a son and myself that are huge fans of Yes. Uh, they can well, run rings over me with what they know about Yes. So <laughs> it's such a long well. history to study. But um, I do, I do do interviews for people with yes and everything. And I said, how come you know more about me than I do? <laughs> <laughs> Which is, uh, confuses me sometimes. Yeah, well, I'm sure that uh, as Paul McCartney has expressed, it's got to be kind of awkward for him to talk to a fan who seems to think they know more about him than he does. So, yeah. well, and, I found out that they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, then that's pretty scary. <laughs> that is pretty scary. 
So, um, Yes has a brand new album coming out. You want to talk about that? Yeah, the um, we did this one different uh, to any other album we made. We did it kind of virtually, and um, um, John and Steve put some of the foundation of the music down in England, and um, Billy showed myself put the rhythm section on in, in Los Angeles, and. Um, and it, it worked out really, really good. And I personally really enjoy it. I, I put it on at first and I went, oh, it's, it's kind of a weird album for a Yes album, but now I'm pretty, pretty much into it. And um, there's a couple of, you know, pretty um, eye-opening tracks on there. There's the one that's a, a kind of a parody on the Beatles and when they broke up. Huh. Uh, What's that called? Yeah, and it's um, it's called Magical Mystery Tour. <laughs> okay. It's the name of the song, and it's it's very good. It's very sing along, and um, I uh, I expect it will probably get quite a lot of yeah, well, but, uh, you're mentioning it means it's automatically going into my radio show on the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, but the um, the first track that's coming out with a video, it's called The Ice Pitch. Hmm. And it's, it's really a great track. I really like it. Very powerful, driving song. And uh, I think people... Again, we'll like it, yeah. Hmm. And the album's coming out October 1st, is it? October 1st. Okay. And um, what's the name of the album? The, the Quest. The Quest, okay. And uh, the band also has plans of touring again, but not until uh, the next spring next year. year, right? And that's a European tour. Um, well, I, think, I believe we're going on the road in March. Till April, then mm. then we go to Europe for a while, and then come back to America. I believe at the end of the okay. Yeah, it's great that you just keep on going, and to me, that's yeah. the sign of a you know a great Kate musician. What's that? The vitamins. <laughs> What's that? I didn't hear you. Keep taking the vitamins. Oh, okay. Eat good. <laughs> You know, I'm always reminded of Ringo. Everybody asks him, why does he keep touring? He says, this is who I am. This is what I do. I'm a musician. You know, I think the idea of going for a year without making a new album or touring, this is, this is the love of his life. This was his dream. And yeah. in your own way, you're living your own dream. So, Yeah, but I think Barbara keeps Ringo going a lot. She's a great person. Mm. Uh, um, now, I like Ringo, um, and you know, my recollection of Ringo, I've met him quite a few times now, yeah. of course, he, he kills, he said, oh, oh yeah, that bloody drummer, <laughs> that's what he calls me, <laughs> he calls me, you're that bloody drummer, <laughs> it was like, you know, uh, he's got a very good sense of humor, and uh, mm. Oh, well, I'm good to him. I found out an interesting stat on it. Ringo's had more hit records since the Beatles broke up with singles uh -huh. than the Beatles. Oh, that's, that's not entirely that's true. true. That's not entirely. I know it's been said uh, the first five years after the Beatle breakup, Ringo had seven top 10 singles in the US. But Paul, yeah. uh, Paul always had more than Ringo and you know continued the, to, but uh, what's that? Get exaggerated. Um, so anyhow, um, I see Paul's coming out with something new as well. So He's always got something in the works. He had a new yeah. album out in December, McCartney 3. <clears throat> and, um, you know, he's been working on an animated film called High in the Clouds. 
That's mm. in the works. He's been working on a musical for It's a Wonderful Life. And I think because of COVID, you know, that slowed things down for uh, there was supposed to be a theatrical showing that they were planning, but uh, I'm sure that was postponed all this time because of that. So that's all things that are in the works. Yeah, he, he always a, keeps busy. He's a bit of a worker. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. I'm all the more grateful because of that. <laughs> Absolutely. And for people like you. Yeah. So, Alan, right. this, this has been wonderful talking with you. And um, we look forward to this new yeah, Yes album and, uh, yeah. and the tour. Absolutely. So Thank thanks for being much. here. All right. And okay. to all of you for watching, thanks for tuning in. And uh, if you haven't subscribed already, please do. And we'll see you next time.